Hello there friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. On this channel, we talk a lot about the Rusan Reformation. It's one of the most important events in Star Wars history. After more than a thousand years of continuous conflict in the galaxy, the Republic decided to completely demilitarize their federal government and also the Jedi Order. This was a really bold move, and a thousand years of conflict would eventually turn into a thousand years of peace. But at the same time, the Galactic Republic was negating its one major responsibility, which was providing safety and security for the rest of the galaxy. There were preparations made, of course, before the Rusan Reformation was enacted. The military would be gradually phased out. It didn't just all happen overnight. And as the federal military was slowly being defunded and broken apart, those funds would be redirected to planetary defense forces and local defense forces. Of course, these funds were inadequate to independently fund an entire PDF for most planets. And so it was really just the planets and regions that could afford or needed security that actually had more robust security forces on them. Today we'll be taking a look at a few different planetary defense forces, we'll break down what exactly their needs are and what they realistically can afford based on their political and economic situation. This will hopefully give you a better understanding of how PDFs were established and maintained. While we're on the subject of PDFs, I thought it'd be a good time to talk about an ongoing crisis in our own planet that is becoming increasingly hard to ignore. It is day 15 right now of the Russian invasion in Ukraine by Vladimir Putin's regime. Russian forces continue their assault on several major Ukrainian cities. I've talked to my friend Lou, an American Ukrainian who recently crossed the border into the country. The fighting spirit of the Ukrainians is still strong and every day more civilians join the battle raging on the front. These are people just like you and me. They work in the service industry. They're teachers, first responders, IT workers, and lawyers. Many of them have never fired a weapon before joining their local territorial defense forces. I've listed several organizations you can donate to in the description down below. These are all uh, cash donations. If you actually want to donate supplies, because I know some of you guys have asked me about this, it's becoming increasingly hard to get stuff over there. If you do have Ukrainian friends or coworkers that you can really trust, you can just donate directly to them. A lot of these guys are going to return back to Poland and physically bring all of that gear uh, basically to the front themselves. That's what my friend Lou did. There's also a lot of Ukrainian civic organizations that are organizing equipment and bringing things to the front, just car load by car load. It's basically become a grassroots movement in military logistics, amazing. Well guys, thank you for your patience. Let's continue on with the rest of the video. Naboo is located in the Midrim. Culturally speaking, this was a planet that was very aligned with Alderaan's galactic view, meaning this was a planet that strongly believed in individual liberty, preserving art, culture, and the natural beauty of the planet. Naboo was a truly lovely place to visit. It was sparsely populated and the quality of life was also very good. But Naboo really lacked major revenue generating industries. Its main exports again were art and cultural items along with some luxury agricultural products. And so for a long time, peace was just expected in the region. There were no threats to the stability of the planet and the thought of tanks rolling down the main avenue of feed seemed ludicrous. A good correlation here is the military spending of Western European countries in NATO. As a general guideline, NATO countries are supposed to spend at least 2% of their GDP on military expenditures. But thanks to the generally peaceful environment in Europe since the Cold War ended, most of these European countries aren't spending even close to 2%. Germany spent only 1.36% of its GDP on military expenditures, Italy spent 1.33%, and Belgium only spent 0.93%, and so on. Only countries like Poland spent close to 2%, perhaps because of their past history and close proximity to the Russian Federation. Ukraine in 2020 spent 4.13% of their GDP on military expenditures, and that's because they've been involved in a border conflict with Russia for more than eight years now. But due to the recent Putin war in Ukraine, Germany has more than doubled their defense expenditures to meet the challenges that face them. I expect many other European powers to do the same. 
Politically speaking, Nabu was in a very similar place to a lot of these Western European powers. Plus, he had the very strong pacifist culture on this planet that really didn't support military spending in the first place. But after large plasma reserves were discovered on Nabu, and the Trade Federation approached as a potential partner in the development of a new energy sector on Nabu, things began changing for the planet. The Royal Nabu Security Force, which was basically just a Secret Service-like entity, all of a sudden had a lot more funds and grew to a much larger size. Nabu's leaders realized that opening themselves to the galactic economy could lead to future crisis, especially now that they were a major energy producer. The Royal Nabu Security Force would grow to around 10,000 to 15,000 individuals in size. This included a core elite group of commandos that guarded the monarch, a larger group of guards that guarded the palace grounds. They also had access to a small collection of ground vehicles. You also had the Nabu Royal Space Fighter Corps, which only had a few squadrons and one starfighters. These are very premium starfighters at 200,000 credits per unit, but they're mainly designed for short range interception missions. Great for defending a planet against pirates, but not so good for offensive strikes against massive capital ships. The Royal Naboo also had some larger luxury yachts, but most of these ships were unarmed and designed for diplomatic civilian use. And that's about all Naboo really had. 10 to 15,000 poorly equipped security guards and a few squadrons of fighters. Remember how we talked about Belgium, which only spends 0.93% of their GDP on military expenditures? Well, they have 25,000 military personnel. And this is in a country with a population of only around 11.5 million people. Naboo, on the other hand, has a population of 4.5 billion people, which is much closer to the population of the entire planet of Earth, let alone one tiny nation. So why is Naboo's military force so small? Well, one could argue that Naboo's militarization mirrored its industrialization, which occurred relatively late in galactic history, and so they're just a bit behind. But then a closer look at the breakdown of the 4.5 billion population number shows us that only 27% are human and 72% are Gungan. The Nabu royal government only represents the human part of the planet. The Gungans actually have their own military force, and even though Nabu and the Gungans don't always have the best relations, when the Trade Federation blockaded the planet, they would actually join forces together. Still, Nabu's planetary defense forces plus the Gungans were far too small to really repel a Trade Federation invasion, which is why they eventually went to the Senate for more support. Next up, we have the case of the Outland Region Security Force. This was a regional defense force that was headquartered on the planet of Iradu in the Outer Rim. The Outland Region Security Force's jurisdiction wasn't just one planet. Instead, they protected the entire greater Saswana sector, which included several other minor planets. Iradu was one of the more developed worlds in the Outer Rim. The planet had a rich reserve of Lamai ore, a key component in Transparis Steel, which could be found on every ship in the galaxy. Grand Moff Wilhuff Tarkin's family were considered one of the founding families on this planet, and most of the men in that family would eventually serve in the Outland Region Security Force. Ranulf Tarkin, the uncle of Wilhuff Tarkin, was one of the leaders of this organization. Ranulf Tarkin also represented the planet of Iradu in the Senate, who was considered somewhat of a militarist by his colleagues. He led a hawkish group of senators who wanted to reinstate the federal military. Randolph Tarkin would greatly increase the defense budget of the Outland Region Security Force. He basically wanted to make it into a quick reaction force that could be called upon by any Republic world. His real motivation was to test out this military force as a template for the future federal military he wanted to establish. Iradu was a planet with a population of over 22 billion. It was a heavily industrialized planet with many different military-related industries that could basically support a standing army. Originally, the Allied Region Security Forces were mainly tasked with fighting pirates and local bandits. But prior to the Stark Hyperspace War, the Allied Region Security Force received significant updates to their equipment. This included new armor, weapons, and heavier squad support weapons. You can really see the difference in kit between these guys when compared to the Royal Naboo Security Force. The Outland, the Outland Region Security Force also had at least a few dozen larger Corellian warships in their fleet. This included several Counselor class space cruisers and Corellian Star shuttles. Many of these ships were donated to the cause by other pro-military worlds like Commodore and Rendelli. These planets also happen to have robust ship manufacturing industries themselves. The fleet also deployed several wings of A6 interceptors. These were short-range light interceptors that were more similar to TIE fighters than X-wings in price, ability, and size.
Lastly, we have the Kuwaiti Sector Forces, one of the largest PDFs in the galaxy and also probably one of the most impressive. Kuwait, as some of you might already know, is home to the massive quad drive yards. This is an orbital shipyard that rings the planet. It's produced some of the largest and most fearsome battleships in galactic history. Kuwait was located in the core, one of the more safe and stable regions of the galaxy, yet it still had a massive planetary defense force for two major reasons. Number one was that Quad Drive Yards is considered one of the most strategically important planets in the Republic because of its shipyard. And so it needs its own permanent task force. Two, Kuwaiti executives wanted to show off their shipbuilding abilities to clients, and so they liked the idea of having a few massive Star Destroyers and Dreadnoughts hanging around the planet. The Kuwaiti Sector Defense Force had massive ships, like the 2500 meter Pro Curator class Star Battlecruiser. They also had the 8000 meter long Mandator class Star Dreadnought. These are massive ships that might cost hundreds of billions of credits to build, not to mention billions more in maintenance and crew salaries. These massive ships represented the power and might of Kuwait, and the Kuwaiti Sector Force not only defended Kuwait, but many other star systems in the region. Even though the Kuwaiti Sector Force was probably one of the most powerful fleets in the galaxy, during the Clone Wars and during the Galactic Civil War, they would not engage outside of their own region. This was primarily a defensive force. So there you have it guys, those are three different planetary defense forces built for different reasons and supported by very different kind of political and economic systems. I hope you guys enjoyed today's video. Please do check those links down in the description below. If you can't afford to donate, that's fine. You can also spread news about what's going on in Ukraine so that it doesn't die from the news cycle. Anyway, guys, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below. I'll see you next time.